Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Kickball Pod. I'll be your host, Colin Freeman, for this episode. In this episode, I sat down with Pierce Galloway at Monterey Bay. Pierce and I spoke about a plethora of topics, including his time growing up in Northern California to all the way to his time now in Monterey Bay. Pierce spent three years at a Division three school in Oregon and had a fantastic time being an All-American, but it was extremely difficult for him to create the necessary exposure to move on to the next level. We spoke about his time at the Division three level and the difficulties he's faced in the college process even getting there, as well as his time with Monterey Bay 2 last summer in USL 2 and how that helped him earn a move to Old Dominion where he performed very well and eventually led him to signing his first professional contract with Monterey Bay. This was a fantastic interview. I learned so much from Pierce about overcoming adversity and how to better yourself as a player. I really hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. And with that, let's get to it. Perfect. Yeah, so I just wanted to start off, just wanted to get to know how your first professional season has been. You know, obviously you made the jump from college this past year. So how has the start of your first professional season been? It's been really good. It's um, It definitely has a different feel than college. Um, I think it's pretty noticeable just with obviously the soccer stuff. Players are better. The game's quicker, but everything else, like it, it's it's your job and you're not, you know, worrying about class or anything like that. So it's good. I mean, it's the life. That I, but um, adjustment, but um, Can you hear me all right? Sorry. I didn't. There we go. Yeah. There something, we go. something happened there with the connection. Yeah, no, I mean, I picked up most of what you were saying there, just the adjustment of the lifestyle and obviously the level. And, you know, I wanted to start off with the lifestyle, you know, for you. I mean, obviously you spent, you know, four years at Willamette and then obviously you're at Old Dominion. So, you know, what's that adjustment been for yourself like of just adjusting to only having to focus on soccer, but also just a different type of demand and a different type of intensity about something about your day? Yeah, I mean, the big difference is just the length of the season um, and the frequency of games obviously is is a massive difference. You know, we're playing 30 high 30s in games over the season, but that's over like nine to eight to nine months versus in the college season, you're playing two, sometimes three games a week shoved in a three month season. So at this level, I've noticed there's a lot more time to work on stuff. There's a lot more time spent on the training field versus in college. It's just like game, 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 recover, do a little bit of prep. Like there isn't that much time on the training pitch, um, which is really nice here, especially like my first year. It gives me a lot of time to develop as a player, which in college, there's there's not much development through training. So that's one thing I've really enjoyed. And I mean... You have training, obviously, but then, you know, there's a lot of other hours in the day for stuff you can do to get better, whether that's a gym session. So the job doesn't stop just after training. There's a lot of other stuff going on, which, I mean, like I said, gives you a chance to get get better, which is which is really nice. Yeah, definitely. I think you make a very good point there about just the, the time spent on the training pitch as well. It's just the other time you can have to allocate to yourself. And I'm curious, you know, a lot of players speak about that time off and you know, some kind of have challenges to that, but you spoke upon, you know, using the kind of develop in other ways within your game. You know, what is some of the stuff you mentioned the gym sessions, what are some of the other stuff you've done in that spare time? Yeah. I mean, as a, as a guy on the team, that's not in this core starting group. There's a lot of other guys in a similar position as me. So, you know, we'll get together, do trainings on the side, you know, if you're not playing 90 minutes, you got to keep your fitness up because anything can happen during the season where you might get called upon to play 90 minutes. So I try to do a good job of, um, especially after the weekend, if I don't play or don't play very much, getting in a long run, that'll simulate something close to the game where it's like 45 minutes to an hour. Um, because, you know, players get injured, players get suspended. And, um, if you're not playing 90 minutes, then you're thrown right into it you know, the fitness level is going to be a bit of a struggle. So doing everything I can to be ready to go for 90 minutes, if need be, um, gym sessions after, after training for sure. 
and then just other like speed and agility sessions that I'm working on to to get quicker which is really nice because like I said in college you just don't have that extra time to do extra that much extra stuff outside of training yeah I definitely think that's a, a very good point I think that speaks a lot into your mentality and I think that's you know even in the professional level, I don't think you see guys maybe spending as much time in their free time as you know doing that extra work and continually trying to develop and I'm curious where that mindset for yourself came from was that something you always kind of had in college of you know, wanting to do extra work in your free time? Or is that something that you've really found at the pro level you're, you needing to do? Um, I would say definitely, definitely in college, probably like sophomore, junior year, where like I started to have real aspirations of going to the next level and knowing that like if you want to get there, there's certain things that you have to do with like just going to training isn't enough. Um, so I would say like midway through my college college career, that's when I really got serious about, you know, taking this pro thing serious and having it as a goal of mine. And um, yeah, that's when I just started, you know, doing everything extra I could um, because I've seen I've seen how it's paid off, like um, coming from D3 to D1, like I've I've seen how it's paid off, how my touch has gotten better, how this has gotten better just from working on it at training when no one else is working on it. So it's easy to keep that same mindset when you see the benefits and the rewards paying off. Um, so yeah, that's just kind of how it was for me. Yeah, definitely. I think you speak a lot on it there and just the aspect of, you know, seeing your work pay off, like you kind of mentioned. And, you know, getting back on the topic of your first professional season, I'm very curious how it was at the start for you being on trial in that process of, you know, also, you know, being what eventually was the first Monterey Bay two players on the first team. But what was that process like of being on trial, especially considering it was your first, you know, real time in a professional setting probably on trial? Yeah, so... I mean, anyone that's that's come from college to pro knows that, like it's so hard and getting even continually harder to get a serious look as a college player to play at the next level. Um, so I was really fortunate that I played with the second team over the summer. I had known Ramiro, who's our assistant coach from when I played club soccer in Santa Cruz. So I'd known him since I was 17, 18 in, in high school. So coming to the second team last summer, knowing Ramiro, um, I got to train with the first team a couple times over the summer. And obviously we had a really good season with the second team. So obviously that helped everything. And then um, it was just the plan with Ramiro. I discussed it in the fall that, you know, they wanted me for preseason. So that was great to have in my back pocket. But I was looking to see, you know, if there are other options available because, you know, having an option is great, but having one option, um, it felt like it felt like a little bit rough only having one option. So I was trying to I was just trying to see what else could be out there. Obviously, it's it's super cool to be trialing and playing at home, but you know, I wanted to see what else could be out there. And I found it really tough to um, get any other trials, anything else going. So when it came down time to start preseason with Monterey, it was kind of like, my only option really. Um, but I think the the team really helped me a lot because there's a lot of experienced older guys. And then there's also a good mix of younger guys. So coming in as a trialist, um, I was already familiar with a lot of the players from over the summer, a couple of the other local players like Walmer from Santa Cruz and Adrian from Watsonville. I train with them when I'm home for winter break or over the summer. So I had a pretty good relationship with those guys. So coming into the locker room as a trialist, it didn't really feel like I was a completely new guy, which was really nice. Um, I can imagine it would be pretty intimidating, like walking into the locker room, not knowing anyone. So I felt like I was in a bit of an advantageous position to come in with already some rapport with the guys. But preseason was really good. You know, I thought they treated us trialists really well. Um, and it's nice because a lot of us ended up getting signed. So there's a good group of us rookies that you know, we're kind of all in this together. So it was a good experience. But I mean, I can see the difficulties of it too, as a college player, like it's really tough. Yeah, definitely. I think you make a good point there about you know, Monterey and other guys as well. And, you know, obviously your story is really interesting. You mentioned multiple times in that process of coming to Monterey Bay too. But, you know, for yourself and your playing style, how much do you think it benefited you that they got a whole summer of watching you play and also the relationship you kind of established within, like you mentioned, the players 
and the coaches yeah. in terms of just seeing what you do every single day, seeing how you work and seeing how to how you develop, you know, how beneficial was that to you in your process of eventually signing yeah. with them? Yeah, it was it was super beneficial. Like I knew so like the summer before I played with Monterey, I played with CFC Atletico, which was the year before the Portland Timbers U23 team. So that was like a really stacked USL2 team. And I didn't play a whole lot, but it was really good exposure to be around these like top D1 players when I was still a D3 player. Um, so that was a really good experience in and of itself. But then the next summer, I was already I was already at Old Dominion in the spring. So and I was coming off all American year for D3. So I was like, all right, I really got to be strategic about where I play summer ball if I'm serious about playing pro. So I was looking at pretty much any USL2 team with a pro affiliation, right? And then Monterey popped up and it was my hometown, like USL2 with the first team connected, like couldn't have been more perfect for what I was looking for, for a summer opportunity. And yeah, being with that team for the whole summer, it was Ramiro was our coach. So like the assistant coach of the first team was the head coach of our second team. So, you know, he's running all our sessions. He's coaching all our games. He's super involved with the whole process. And, you know, obviously he can learn a lot about me as a, as a soccer player, but learning what I bring to the table as a leader and other stuff, other stuff off the field, I think really speaks volumes about just like getting to know the person as well as a player, because I know there was a big emphasis um, from Monterey on like building a really good culture in the locker room this year. So, you know, they want to bring in individuals that are going to be beneficial to the overall culture. So I think over that summer, obviously my, my play spoke for itself, but you know, that I'm going to be someone that they want to have around um, for reasons outside of just soccer. Yeah, definitely. Again, you speak off on there at the end of just, you as a person and how important that cultural aspect is. And I think that's a really important aspect, like you mentioned. And totally. yeah. you, know, you brought up so many times your pathway from the division three to the division one level. And that's something I really want to get into, but you know, I want to start from the beginning, you know, your youth career and how you eventually ended up at Willamette and, you know, your process of developing, but, you know, if you could just talk about your youth career and how you ended up at Willamette eventually, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I'm, I grew up in Carmel, which is a really nice area to grow up in, but it's a small town with not a lot of like opportunity, not near a really big city. So playing youth soccer was really tough. We had a, a local team in Monterey with a lot of talented players from the area, which was really great until we went to a, like the game transition to 11 v 11. And then we just couldn't get enough quality players to like keep competing with, you know, some bigger teams from around the area. And that's around the same time the U S Academy was forming with like the U 14 age group as the new lowest age group. So um, a bunch of the players from my Monterey team moved to the Santa Cruz breakers, which was probably like an hour commute from my house. So me and a couple of my other teammates from Monterey made the jump to Santa Cruz when I was in seventh grade and you know, that's when the U.S. Academy was really taking off. You know, we were going on trips across the country, playing top programs, MLS teams. So, you know, some powerhouses in Southern California, going to showcases in Florida. You know, that's when things started to really take off is, you know, I, I was developing in middle school, obviously. And then, you know, high school, it gets a bit more serious. You know, we're going to Seattle and Portland for a weekend. So that experience was really good to compete against some of the top players in the country and you know being a smaller team smaller academy from santa cruz we weren't the best team we weren't the, like the most well-off team but like getting to compete at the top level is really where you can test yourself you know playing earthquakes academy galaxy sounders timbers like all these teams in our region like looking back some of the players that i played against in these showcases in florida and texas um it's pretty cool that i got that opportunity so i was extremely grateful to play for the breakers um had some great coaches as well, like Ramiro, obviously building that connection there was super cool. And then, you know, getting recruited, it was, um, those showcases were big for recruiting. They were like the main way you get recruited to be seen by college coaches around the country. So there was a showcase in Florida in the winter. And then in this, in like the summertime, it was, it was more on the West coast. We'd come to like Southern California. And so those were the really big opportunities to get seen by college coaches. And 
in high school, like my junior year when recruiting really starts going, I was, I was pretty small. I hadn't had a growth spurt. So I was, you know, really technical. Um, that's my game, really technical, really good on the ball, but like a lot shorter than I am now and a lot skinnier. So a lot of D1 coaches didn't really look at me too closely. Um, and so that was, that was honestly pretty disappointing because I thought for sure, you know, I'm a D1 player, like, um, you know, I'm see some of the guys that are getting signed to these D1 schools that I'm emailing and we're playing them on the weekend. And I'm like, these guys aren't that good. Um, and that's when I kind of had to switch my focus to D3 because my grades were also really good. So I didn't want to settle for a school that was below my academic standard just for soccer, right? So that's when I started looking at some D3 schools that, you know, had the academics and had a good soccer program. And well, Lamet really just came into the picture because um, honestly, like, I don't, I don't really know. Like I cast a wide net and the coach there was the assistant coach at the time, Jared Rust recruited me you know, he was going to take over the program for my freshman year. And just from talking with him, like I could get a sense like, okay, this guy's really serious about soccer. Like he plays the game, how I want to play it. And he has a vision for me, my um, freshman year to like be a core part of the team. So I was like, great. Like, I don't want to go to college and sit on the bench for the first two years of my college experience. So it was really Jared that sold me on the whole Willamette experience. And I mean, it was, it was everything I could have hoped for, honestly. It was, um, you know, a freshman season where I played, I started and played almost every minute. Um, sophomore year it was COVID year, but it was a similar situation. And then, you know, capping it off senior year with like one of the best seasons I could have had and the team could have had. So I think it was really important for me to be able to go in freshman year and see the field immediately and be a key player and a starter immediately where a lot of teammates or people I knew like went to a, a D one school and just sat the bench their first two years even. So I think going in immediately and getting on the field really helped my development. And then obviously I took off uh, growth wise and size wise. I had a growth spurt kind of, late in high school into early college. And that's when I, you know, kind of really established myself and my body kind of caught up to where my game was. But yeah, coming from high school, it was not easy, not easy to get recruited for sure. Yeah, definitely. You know, your story is very inspiring for a lot of players. And I think it speaks about just kind of how everyone develops differently. And you know, I want to speak about those years in high school for yourself and, you know, kind of that process of, like you mentioned, you know, your ability on the ball was, you know, at a very high level. And unfortunately, the country we are in, that's it's not always valued, and especially considering if you're at a smaller size. So, you know, for yourself, you spoke upon the difficulty of just, you know, seeing players you're playing against that, you know, are at sign and individual level thinking these guys are not better than me. You know, what was yeah. kind of your headspace at that point? You know, did you feel demoralized at all or was that something you just kind of thought of like I'm going to prove a point eventually like eventually I'm going to prove that I belong at this level what was kind of the thought process for yourself going through that yeah I mean it's pretty cool like now I'm a I'm a pro player and looking back on all these all these D1 coaches that passed on me all these coaches that never responded to my email or my text message it's it's pretty cool now to look back to be like yeah I, I proved you wrong but I wouldn't say that was the uh that was the main like driving factor. I mean, there were definitely some pretty demoralizing times where like there was one school that I was like really, really interested in. And I'd gone to their ID camp a couple of times. I'd played in their like all-star game at the camp. Like I thought I was one of the best players at the camp. Um, it was the California school. So they'd see me play on some like more local games too, not just the showcases. And I got an email that like, they'd gone with a different player or whatever. So they were done with that recruiting class. And I was just like a punch to the gut. Cause I thought, not that it was a sure thing, but I felt pretty good about the opportunity and felt like I had a good relationship with the coach. And when it broke down, it was like, it was pretty, it was pretty demoralizing. Cause I was like, all right, 
I was kind of eggs, all my eggs in that basket. And now I've got to figure out what's next. It's probably not D1 at this point. So I got to be happy wherever I'm going. Um, so that's when like, I really had to look for other options. And that's, that's never easy when you have in your mind one way of how you think things are going to go. And then like, it's complete opposite. But I think um, my parents were really helpful during that time, um, you know, highlighting the other benefits of going to a D3 school because I got a phenomenal education, um, you know, great college experience. Like I regret nothing about Willamette. Like my time there was incredible. Capping it off senior year with all, all that we accomplished, like, like I couldn't have hoped for anything better. So, you know, it's easy to look back and, you know, feel like mad at these coaches or like bitter towards them but I'm just happy with the experience I got. And I think if I had done anything differently, I wouldn't be where I am today. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a fantastic way to put it. And, you know, not to harp on this too much, but I think it's a situation you're now seeing more and more commonly, whether that's trans the transfer portal and players, you know, like you mentioned, maybe not being happy after one or two years of not playing or like your situation in high school where you have a vision of, you know, you're going to play division one or at a specific level and it doesn't work out. So what advice did you just give to players that, you know, are in a situation like that and kind of adapting and resetting your expectations and not letting it kind of take over your whole thought process? Because a lot of times I think, you know, for a player that to have something like that, that can be such a, like you said, a punch to the gut, it can be so hard sometimes to overcome it. Yeah, I think, I had a I had another really not rough time, but it was definitely a difficult period when I had played the summer with CFC in Oregon and I was, you know, around top D1 players every day for training. Um, you know, they they liked me, thought I was a good player, which I was like, great, I'm gonna use this to transfer for the spring after I'm done in the fall with Willamette. Um, and I was I was in the portal. Um and it was like the same thing. It was the same thing as high school. Like I was emailing all these coaches. I was like, I'm going to get all these offers. Like I'm going to know where I'm transferring to like in September, I'm going to have it done early so I can focus on, you know, finishing strong with Willamette. I'm going to get it done early. I have, you know, all these players that are going to help me, all these coaches from CFC. They're going to make it so easy for me. Um, and it was completely the opposite of that. Like emailing, sending highlights, like my stats were good. Like my film was incredible sending it to these these schools every week and getting nothing back and like understandably like I was just so focused on getting that done that luckily it wasn't affecting my performance on the pitch at all but it was it was affecting my like mood everything was completely thrown off because I just had it in my head that like I'm gonna get this transfer thing done early I'm gonna have a really good offer um and you know that's never how it really goes especially in the fall transferring for the spring, it's not easy. So it took me a while to step back and realize that. Um, but just not being so attached to the outcome and like living in the present, enjoying the moment. I'm really glad I sort of, that period was mainly like in the summer in August, like preseason before the fall season really started. Cause like once I started playing at Willamette with my team, a lot of those feelings kind of went away and I started to enjoy, you know, my last season with the guys you know, trying to make it our best season in program history. So just living in the present, not being too attached to the outcome, enjoying the journey, I think is super important because when you get too attached to a certain outcome, you stop enjoying the journey and then every day becomes less fun. Um, it just becomes more of a grind instead of something that you enjoy to do every day. So that was a big mindset shift for me where, you know, just get back to enjoying soccer, playing with your friends, winning games, scoring goals, that sort of thing. Yeah, that's a fantastic mindset. And I think, you know, like you mentioned there, sometimes it takes a difficult situation again to kind of make you realize that and have to go through those tough moments. And again, I think that's great advice for any player. And you know, I want to get into, you know, like you said, that process of what you mentioned, the start of playing right away a little bit and how much that kind of appealed to you and just, you know, having that relationship with your coach of being, feeling really valued, you know, how do you think that kind of progressed you as a player versus you know, maybe a theoretical situation where you go somewhere else and maybe you don't play as much, you know, how much confidence wise and also ability wise do you think you were able to develop and just 
enjoy yourself and enjoy life because you were playing every single day and, you know, having a good time. Yeah, I think, you know, yeah, I think that was super important for my journey, um, especially for my mental health and mindset as well. Like I was never someone that through club was like sitting on the bench all that often. And then like one year I had a coach that didn't really like me. So I sat on the bench a lot, but like going in and playing right away, I think was really good for my overall confidence. And just um, like if I had gone in, even at a higher level, like a D1 school, like you said, and sat on the bench. I don't know. That would have like not make or break like how I respond to it, but I think it definitely would have been a very trying period, especially as a freshman in college, um, moving to a new area, living away from home. So I'm really fortunate that that was the case where I went in and played a lot. I think a large part of that was, especially in the recruiting process, like I would tell anyone is like, really make sure that you enjoy the coach that you have because coaches change pretty frequently in college soccer, obviously, but like that coach is a big part of your journey. And if there's someone that you really like and you want to play for, then that's a great decision and great opportunity. But if you're not sold on the coach, like the same way they treat you in the recruiting process is how they're going to treat you when you're their player. So I was super confident in everything that Jared had told me going into my freshman year that I knew he was a guy I was going to want to play for and that I was going to get better under two based on the type of soccer he wanted to play because it's how I like to play the game, how I wanted to play the game. So definitely improving with a coach that saw the game, how I saw the game and, you know, could talk about it extremely tactically and help me break stuff down, help me work on things. So I think that was that was really important having a great coach coupled with the opportunity of being on the field. Yeah, definitely. Again, fantastic point of just having that relationship with your coach and also having the opportunity to play and kind of express yourself during that. And you know, a point a point you mentioned earlier is kind of that shift in mindset kind of in your sophomore, junior year of, you know, wanting to be a professional. And I'm curious what triggered that throughout the course of your college career. You know, was there a specific moment or you know, was it something that kind of just developed over time? How did that kind of approach and what, what changed within your day, a, daily actions based upon that? Yeah, so, I mean, I was always, like, super competitive. Like, I wanted to be the best on my team, be the win everything possible, right? Um, but D3, when I was D3, I didn't really see the path, like, how there would be a pathway to play professional because I see how difficult it even is for D1 guys to play professional. So obviously I was like still competitive, still wanted to push myself to be the best version of me, but I didn't really think about like how serious I could be about playing pro until I think it was the winter break of my junior year, sophomore year. And the Monterey Bay team had just been announced and I was home for break training with um, Walmer, who is the first signing of, of, in club history, and Adrian, who is going on preseason, who's now a starter for the team. Um, and we train. Um, there are a couple other pros that would come. You know, I, I thought I was doing really well in these trainings. You know, they're talking to me like, yeah, like you really have a chance. Like you're you're doing really well. Like I'm surprised you're playing D3. Like you should be playing D1. And I was kind of like, like, maybe they're right. Like, you know, I – was pretty confident with how I was playing, but I never really got that outside reinforcement, I guess, of, you know, hey, like you can you can really take this thing to the next level if you're serious about it. So kind of from that point on, I was like, I had you know my own internal drive, but I had people outside like reinforcing, like not just people outside, but people that were playing at the level I wanted to play at, reinforcing like, hey, you know, you're you're a really good player. You can you can play at a higher level you can, you know, keep pushing yourself. And from that point on, you know, that's when I made the decision to play with CFC over the summer, knowing that, you know, I wouldn't play a lot, but the trainings would be super important for me because they were D1 players from Stanford, UCLA, Portland, like where I wanted to play at as well, the higher, the higher D1 level as well. So I was like, you know, this is a, another step I need to take in my journey it might not be great in the moment because I'm going to spend a lot of time on the bench, but I know it'll benefit me in the long run in that spring going into the summer with CFC. That's when I like told myself, I was like, all right, if you're, 
going to be a pro, like you got to start acting like a pro. So I, you know, changed what I was eating, stopped going out on the weekends as much, had a more disciplined gym regiment, um, was doing extra trainings outside of training. So it was just a, a lot of things that kind of went into that. Like, I think the Monterey Bay team getting announced was, was really big because, you know, that's right, right next door from where I live. So I knew that was going to be a good opportunity. So just like having a mindset shift shift of like, you're not, not trying to be a pro, like you are a pro now. So start acting like one. Yeah. I mean, again, I think that's what, that's what it takes a lot of times when you're in the position of, you know, having to make up ground like somebody like yourself. And I think you make a lot of good yeah. points there about, you know, that external validation, sometimes how important that is. And, you know, for, for yourself, sure. seeing that with the, the guys that I mentioned signed in Monterey as well as, and obviously that opportunity with the Timbers U23. I want to speak upon that as well, because I think that that must have been a really interesting experience for yourself of seeing how you compete against these guys that are, you know, top schools, like you mentioned, and kind of the confidence part of it. You know, we talk so much about how important it is to play for yourself and have that experience. And, you know, in that situation, like you said, you didn't play that much, yet you have a lot of, po it seems like you have a lot of positive feelings when you talk about it. So, yeah. You know, for yourself, how were you able to take the best aspects of that and kind of add in terms of your confidence and how you feel of how you can progress on as a player? Yeah, so that team we had that summer was was a really good team. Um, a lot of the players are, you know, still playing at a high level, college soccer, or have gone pro like myself. Um, so our, our team that summer was stacked. And I knew that was going to be the case because the summer before, same exact story, like a bunch of guys get drafted. Um, and it was like in the same city I was going to college. So I knew it was going to be a good opportunity, but I knew it was going to be a difficult opportunity because I was the only D3 player on the roster. Everyone else is coming from out of the area to get housed and, you know, play for this team. So we had a lot of good players, but I think it was, I do look back at it with fond memories now, but in the moment it was not easy because kind of a similar thing I said earlier, like these guys are good players, but you know, I'm, I'm right there and not getting rostered for games or sitting on the bench. It was really difficult, but um, getting that experience and training, being around that sort of environment definitely elevates you. So I can look back on it now with fond memories, but in the moment, there were some rough times for sure where it's like, why am I not playing? Like, just cause this guy goes to whatever school, like he's getting preferential treatment. They can treat me however they want. Cause they know my coach isn't going to call them and ask why I'm not playing. So there was some stuff where I had to navigate. Like, I know it's a bit political as well, um, which sucked because, you know, it should be the best players playing the games, but looking back, it was a, it was a great experience and, you know, tough to keep my confidence up, but I kind of just had a mindset going in the whole time that like, no matter how much you play, like this is going to help you in the long run. This is going to be a good experience because I think if I hadn't had that experience and tested myself with some of the best players in the country that I don't know how well that fall season would have gone with Willamette. And then that might've affected my ability to transfer D1 after that. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a really good mindset. And I think, you know, your expectations going in are a great example for a player of, you know, how to take the best out of a situation like that. Because I think you were able to prove yourself that you could compete at that level. And I think that's what confidence is at the end of the day, proving yourself that you're good enough. And, you know, I want to speak about that final season as well. We already alluded to it a little bit of, you know, you have this thought process going in about I'm going to transfer, I'm going to have this all figured out. And, you know, you look at statistically that final season for you, you know, you mentioned it earlier, that was almost the best case scenario for yourself personally in the team. So yeah, how special did it feel to end on that note at Will and, you know, accomplish so much in that final season? Yeah, I mean, like I said, looking back, like it honestly couldn't have gone much better personally and as the team. Um, it was an interesting season because the season before we had lost a lot of older players and – we knew that there were going to be a lot of freshmen coming in that were going to have to play a big role. So like seasons where it was like, we have to do well or else the season's a failure. It was a lot of unknown of like, how's the team going to gel? Like we have a good core returning, but like these new guys are going to have to come in and step up. So it wasn't like an overwhelming feeling of, 
we're going to be really good this year. It was like, we could be really good. Like, we'll kind of just see what happens, whatever happens, happens. Um, but we had some amazing freshmen step up, um, some, some really good players. And I mean, the season just started well and just continued and continued to go. I mean, we were playing some of the best soccer I've been a part of with any team. It's one of the most fun teams I've ever been a part of. I mean, winning like so many games, obviously, makes it easier scoring a ton of goals blowing teams out like that makes it really fun but I think all the guys all the guys will look back 20 years from now you know probably one of the best seasons in program history um, hopefully it's not the last but I mean individually like playing some of probably the best soccer of my of my career so far so yeah, I'll always look back on that season with fond memories and obviously like I don't need the external validation of these like awards that I got after the season to, you know, change how I felt about the season, but it's obviously nice to be recognized nationally for some of the stuff that we were able to accomplish because, you know, the awards I got reflect even more, I feel like on the team. So it's nice to put like Willamette, not a nationally recognized D3 program with some of these other schools on the East coast on the map a little bit. So I felt like we definitely did that. So it's cool to look back on. Yeah, I mean, you make a very good point there at the end of kind of how you were able to put Wilmot on the map nationally and how good that must have felt for yourself personally. To, you know, obviously, like you said, the awards and a little bit of extra validation, but also, you know, be able to just to say, this is where I went. Like, they deserve it as much as I do. So I think that's a very good exactly. thing. Exactly. Well, yeah. And, you know, obviously, you had that final year at Old Dominion as well. And you've talked about a little bit of the difficulty of trying to find where you were, yeah. where, what you were going to do for that final year. But I'm curious kind of how that opportunity arose and also why you thought that might be the right fit for your final year. Yeah, it was, uh, it was interesting. Like, I think I first started talking to them in early October, maybe. Um, it's funny. It's such a weird coincidence. The, um, there was a player that was playing at Corbin, which is an NAIA school in Salem, which is the same town Willamette is in. So we were like crosstown rivals. It was always a preseason game. And so there was one of my best buddies from the summer team at CFC. He was the goalie there. So, you know, good rivalry, good, good fun between us. And, you know, we played Corbin and then um, Derek, the player that was at Corbin had recently transferred from Old Dominion. And he was living with Quinn, my friend from the summer team, the goalie. And but Derek was going back to ODU in the spring to be a volunteer assistant coach. And so I this is at this point, I was like sending my information to anyone that would take it. Um, any D1 program. Like I didn't really care where I was going. You know, obviously I I had this whole like master's degree, but like I was willing to do any program. Like I just wanted to play D1. And so um, the the head coach of Corbin texted me one day. He was like, oh, have you reached out to Old Dominion? And I was like, <laughs> looking at my long list of schools that I had emailed, I was like, yeah, I reached out to them, never heard anything back. He was like, huh, I, I heard they reached out. I was like, this is weird. Like, what does Tim, the coach of Corbin, know about, like, my transfer process? And uh, apparently they had my phone number wrong. So they I got a text, like, right after that, like, hey, this is Nate Jones, assistant coach of Old Dominion. You know, we'd love to chat. We've heard about you from Derek. Um, so I was like, wow, this is like the first real interest I've had in months and months. So this is pretty cool. And that's when I started doing a bit more research about the program. And, you know, is this going to be a good spot for me? And they had a master's program that I could do online, which means, you know, when I left the, the school this past fall, I can continue my classes online. I don't have to be there, which is great because I'll finish it this summer. And, you know, they compete in one of the best conferences in the country, you know, wins against Marshall last season. So I was like, this is going to be really cool. Um, never visited the school, just had a couple phone calls. Um, I really liked Nate. He was, uh, he seemed like a really good assistant coach. Um, honestly didn't really know much what I was getting myself into but I was like this is probably going to be one of the best opportunities I'll get playing in a really good conference I think there's opportunity for me to get on the field as well so I was like might as well take it 
Yeah, that's obviously a very interesting story. And we were just about to end here. I think we were about five minutes left. So I'm going to end it here and then we'll talk about the rest of the, in the five minutes on the other one. I'll send you the link right after this. Sounds good. Put it up here. Yeah, so just touching off where we left off there with your story of how you ended up the Old Dominion, I think, you know, you said some very interesting things there and you were talking about, you know, how you never visited the school and obviously you were kind of going on, you know, a glimpse there. Like you said, you just wanted to play D1. And I'm curious, you know, was there any doubt that it might not work out or was it just something that you were like, I need to do this to, you know, fulfill my dream of one playing Division One, but also push on for that next opportunity to try to push on and be a professional? There definitely was doubt at points if like I was if it was even going to work out to play D1 because like in my mind, I thought that there was going to be opportunities coming earlier. There were going to be more opportunities, but then it got to a certain part where like there was nothing. I literally had nothing going and I was like, dang, maybe this won't work out. Maybe like I need to look at some different schools. Like maybe I need to go here. Like, so there was a point for sure where I was like, maybe it won't work. So I was looking at some other options of what that spring could look like because, you know, I was graduating in the fall. I finished the semester early to make that happen where I could make the jump in the, in January. So I could have a spring and fall with wherever I was transferring to, but for sure there was doubt where it's like, I literally have like no prospects right now. What's, what's going to happen. Um, and luckily it didn't get to that point where I had to, you know, make a judgment call on what was best, where I was going to go, what I was going to do. But for sure, it got tough at points where I didn't think it was going to work out. Yeah. yeah, I think that's that's good insight there, just talking about it, the difficulty of that process and how, you know, I think it's something a lot of people don't see sometimes. So I really appreciate you saying that. And, you know, I'm also curious, once you got there, I think, that, you know, there's a perception that, you know, oh, you maybe played at Division three level, you know. You know, obviously, you mentioned there earlier on about, you know, pros obviously feeling like you were good enough. But did you feel like there was any doubt amongst maybe your, even your own teammates about, oh, he's just a Division three player once you got there? Was it, you know, an environment where it was extremely welcoming? I think, you know, I looked this past year and I looked at a lot of Division three players that are trying to make the, the jump to Division one level. And, you know, I know there's a lot out there that are definitely good enough, but, you know, can you kind of put into perception whether there was any doubt about, you know, your ability? Um, I think going there, it was a, like from when I graduated with Lamont and moved into ODU, it was, it was a complete whirlwind where I think I drove back to California like December 18th, went on a vacation with my family for like, a week and a half came home had like five days at home and then flew to the east coast and moved in and it was like it was a crazy whirlwind where like you know I was just like moving across the country to a new state like that part was a bit intimidating because you're like coming in especially halfway halfway through the year you're the new guy trying to fit in luckily I moved into a house with a lot with uh, like five other guys on the team so it was that made it easy for me to fit in sort of right away just you know living together we do everything together um but there was yeah it was definitely a challenging time I, I think especially coming in in the spring and trying to fit in um but I think on the field you know I was confident in my ability especially like my confidence was probably at an all-time high coming off the fall season so it wasn't like I was struggling for, you know, feeling good about my play at that time. And, you know, I was like, well, this first training is kind of going to, or the first week of training is kind of going to give me a, a, a baseline of, you know, how I compete at this level. And, you know, it went, it went great. And, you know, I never really looked back after the first, first couple weeks or so, but I don't think it's very common for someone to transfer D3 to D1 and then, you know, be a core part of the team like I was last fall. So I think it is a testament to the, to the hard work I put in, but also, you know, I've kind of felt like this everywhere I've been at where I'm able to pretty quickly adjust to the next level or the next step I'm taking up, um, whether that be D3 to D1 or D1 to now USL championship where I'm playing now. Um, 
but I think I earned the respect and trust of the team pretty quickly. And, you know, once I have that, I'm not the guy that's ever going to ever going to lose that with the team where, you know, they st- suddenly I start playing bad and they start thinking, you know, oh, we shouldn't trust Pierce with the ball or, you know, he's not as good as we first thought. Like once I earn that trust, I feel like, you know, I'll keep it for the most part. Yeah. I think you make a good point there about earning that trust and how important that is. And just like you said, I think you're an anomaly and that you've adapted to pretty much everywhere you've been. But you know, there's one final piece of advice here. And I think there's more players in this past cycle from the Division Three level that will transfer to the Division One level. And obviously all of them want to be a core part of the team. So is there any piece of advice that you could give to those Division Three players who will be making the jump to the Division One level this upcoming fall? Yeah, I would say, you know, just challenge yourself to play at the highest level possible. Um, yeah, like you said, I think even just like two, I guess it's, I guess just a year, year and a half ago when I was doing it, even the transfer portal itself was not as big of a thing as it is now. So I think it's good. I, I do think it's good, the transfer portal for D3 players to take the step up, up because like you said, there are a lot of good players in the division three level, like myself, that got overlooked in high school but you know through four years three four years of development are you know good players and can can compete with the best of them so I saw it myself when we were playing in the national tournament against U Chicago I'm like these guys are all pretty good like um they could take the next step up for sure so I think challenging yourself at the highest level is really important you know can you really play there um and you know obviously having the best season you can I think team success, individual success comes from team success. Like if if we hadn't had the season that we did, I think it would have been really difficult for me to transfer. Um, but having a great team season, obviously individual accolades, if you're one of the best players on the team, are going to come with that. So I think doing everything you can for the team that you're currently at, like not focusing on, you know, where you're going to transfer to. Like I was so caught up in at one point and focusing on, you know, hey, if I have a really good season here, like people are going to notice. So I think that's really important as well. Yeah, that's great advice. And just putting the team success first more than anything else. So listen, I really appreciate you coming on and telling everyone about your story. And I think it's so inspiring to, you know, make the jump and have the story you have. And, you know, personally, I'm so inspired listening to, you know, someone who's made the jump from the Vision 3 level eventually to the pro level. So Really appreciate you coming on and telling your yeah. story. I think it'll help it. so many players. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. It was a good chat for sure. Definitely. I hope we stay in touch moving forward here. I wish you the best of luck the, the rest of the way in your first professional season. We'll be rooting for you the rest of the way. I, Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yep, definitely. Have a good day and we'll be in touch soon. All right, see ya. Bye. Thank you. Bye.